From coast to coast and around the world, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord covers the major Christian events in America and across the world from the heart of Europe. To the tip of Africa. From the centers of Asia. Central and South America. You're a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Join us from Anaheim, California for the 1999 Summer Harvest Crusade with special guests Pastor Chuck Smith, Crystal Lewis, Small Town Poets, the Harvest Crusade Band, and a special message by Pastor Greg Laurie. Welcome to Anaheim, California, the 10th anniversary of the Harvest Crusade right here at the Edison Field, the home of the Anaheim Angels. The Anaheim <laughs> Angels is where they play ball, and tonight we're going to be having church, and we're inviting you to stay with us for a, a great, great evening of preaching and the singing of the gospel, and we believe that you're going to be challenged. For many years now, your TVN station, the Praise the Lord program, to be specific, has covered the Harvest Crusade with Pastor Greg Laurie, and we have seen God do some marvelous things. He's just, we've seen these people walk out on the fields and lives be transformed, and I'm convinced that tonight's going to be no different. God's going to do his thing tonight. I believe he is. We have some uh, great guests and the ones that a lot of them that you're familiar with seeing on the Harvest Crusades, uh, such as Greg Laurie, who will be bringing the message every evening, and Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel and one of the, the, the people who has actually organized over the years the Harvest Crusade and we have well have the Harvest Crusade Praise Band is going to be here as usual we always enjoy their music yes, and, and there's a group that we've not heard Dean it's called Small Town Poets. Small Town Poets. I think they picked <laughs> Dean and Mary. We're the Small Town Poets too I guess but we have the, the Small Town Poets that will be here and Crystal Lewis, also yes. one of the very, very favorite, one of my favorites. Oh, mine too, and she's everybody's favorite. I mean, that gal can sing. If you've not watched Harvest Crusade, uh, wherever you are, as it's been on Praise the Lord every year, stop what you're doing. Tune in tonight. You've got to watch it. You know, one, one thing I love about Harvest Crusade and Pastor Greg Laurie is he always emphasizes that God doesn't turn anybody away. No matter what you've done or where you've been or what a failure you think you are, God has a special place and a special undying love for you. You know, Mary, a lot of people, I, I, I can associate that with my life, and I know that, that we can. A lot of people look at us, or they look at a Greg Laurie or a Pastor Chuck Smith people, and they say, well, they must feel differently than I do. You know, we all feel exactly the same. We feel just like you do. We, we sometimes wonder how we ever got here or how, how that we got a, to be a member of the family or of why, God. Or why that God would love us. You know, because it's, we know all the bad parts, just like you're thinking maybe tonight about all the bad parts in your life. God loves you. Just the grace of God. Uh, Greg Laurie in the Harvest Crusade has put out this little brochure, and it says, what happens after I die? He's going to answer some of those questions that you have tonight. And I would just like to read for you. Should I read a, a short scripture, Dean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From the third chapter of Romans. God has shown us a different way to heaven. Verse 21 begins by saying, not by being good enough and trying to keep his laws, but by a new way, though not new really for the scriptures told about it a long time ago. Now God says he will accept and acquit us, declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we can all be saved in the same way by coming to Christ no matter who we are or what we have been like. Is that good? It's wonderful. No matter what we have 
been like, been like or who we are or who we are so no matter what you've been like or who you are in the name of Jesus we speak that this night and this entire harvest crusade as you watch it and as you experience you don't just watch the harvest crusade you have to experience that it will be something that will change you revolutionize you and that you will receive Jesus Christ as Lord that is the emphasis that's the heartbeat of, uh, of all of the ministries that are here at Harvest Crusade. So, And at any time, if, if, if you feel the tugging at your spirit, at your heart, there's a number on the screen for you to call, 714-731-1000. Feel free at any moment to go pick up that phone and, and join there with a prayer partner. So I think that it's time we go into the service. Yeah. And I don't know if they want me to run camera or not tonight, but I feel, I feel like that I've been here so many years doing this that I want to help the cameraman to go right into the service. And, and let's see if we can find somebody praising God right now. Come on.
And we are happy to have uh, one of our guests here at the Harvest Crusade, the 10th anniversary, I believe it is, of Harvest Crusades right here in Anaheim, California. That's the uh, pastor and Reverend Chuck Smith from, uh, from uh, Costa Mesa, California. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you again. Great to have you here. <laughs> we uh, we were talking before we you know any of this started. We said if we could just get Pastor Chuck to smile once in a while, we'd have a big story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you have something to smile about here with oh, the Harvest Crusade. Oh, it's exciting to see God work always. You know, always. We were noticing uh, the little flyer. Matter of fact, I can see it on the wall. What happens after I die? That's a that's a pressing and a very important question nowadays. Isn't that interesting? Of course, these have been out for a while, but yet uh, with a prominent. Uh, news coverage on John Kennedy's death, you know, it yeah. makes it extremely relevant. People are really asking that question. You know, there's sort of a feeling uh, when young people have that feeling of immortality, you know, and they, they don't like to think right. of death and yet something like this makes the uh, fact of death a very relevant thing to them. Yeah. And so uh, I think that it's going to have a good effect as far as waking people up to the fact that we need to be ready because we don't know when we might go on a tailspin and that's it, you oh, know. Right. Pastor Chuck Smith, you've, you've been a pastor for how many years now? Over 50. <laughs> Over 50. <laughs> and, and you've seen people in your church auditorium walk the aisles, but this must be a special, special blessing to you to see this for the 10th year, the people coming out on the fields of, of this stadium here. Mary, I never get over the thrill and the excitement of seeing people come to Jesus Christ. And here, where you look, you know, and you see the whole outfield covered with people, it is just moving, very moving. And, and what I notice about him, Pastor Smith, is they're not typically the kind of people that you would see walk the aisles in the church sometimes. I, I, you know, we all look and we see that, that they're not. Yes. But the commitments, you see the tears, you see the, uh, the, the friends that have brought them and the excitement and all. And it is just a very moving experience, just great. You know, it's a, something we've experienced here as being the, the, the TV host for TBN for several years, I, I think seven years for us coming out here. But we have seen uh, and gotten to know so many of you and we feel like we're, we're friends more than just uh, acquaintances. But we've seen an unconditional love and acceptance. We watch the, uh, the, the the uh, prayer uh, coordinators on the field as they're yeah. praying with people who are not dressed maybe so well and people who maybe, you know, they don't, they don't fit the mold of, of, uh, of religion, but we see them accepted as they are. You know, several years ago when uh, the hippies were coming to the church uh, in great numbers, yeah. Right, yeah. and uh, one evening as I was speaking, this young girl came in and uh, she had a, a blouse that was open down to her navel. Well. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, I really need to talk about decorum in the church. I really need to talk about respect for the house of God and just, uh, you know, yeah, right. give a few words of, of, of the importance of, of dressing properly. And the spirit just spoke to my heart and said, just give him my love. Wow. And, that girl was the first one forward that night to accept Jesus and said, I thought, oh, I'm so glad I didn't her. get into that kind of stuff. You know, she had a need yeah. and uh, God was dealing with the need in her life and that was only a, a manifestation of the need. It was just a symptom of what was really, uh, you know, the emptiness within right. and the, the need to attract people right, and so right. forth. And when she came to Jesus, the needs were all met, wow. you know. And you could have driven her away. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know, and you know, so. what I, I get from that, and I'm learning, I'm, I'm, because I can remember some things that I've done and said in the name of the Lord to people, <laughs> and I'm embarrassed now about some of the things I've done, but we, but we find out that there is the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and all we are is a messenger of God, and if we'll let the Holy Spirit take charge, control, and bring can, conviction on people's lives, they'll come to the Lord a whole lot quicker. He can do a much better <laughs> job than we can. I, I found that out. Can. I believe he can. <laughs> Pastor Smith, uh, this is not the only place that you have harvest crusades right here no, in Anaheim. No, actually, they're, they're going national and actually going over to Australia soon. So uh, going to become international. Wow. So it's exciting. 
uh, as more and more people hear about what God's doing. Of course, uh, these are uh, put on the internet so that people Man. in Australia will be watching this event. And yeah. uh, so it's exciting because it, God is uh, raising Greg up in a really very special way and is yeah. using him and we're just thrilled. Well, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing thousands and thousands and multiplied hundreds of thousands of people come to the Lord because of, uh, of the Holy Spirit, Chuck Smith and, and Greg Laurie and all of the team of the Harvest Crusade. And, and uh, we believe that this 10th anniversary of Harvest Crusade will be a time just especially designed for you and for you to come to the Lord. How many people last year, can you remember generally how many people came to the Lord at the, at the Anaheim Harvest Crusade last summer? It was over 13,000. <laughs> My goodness. Well, we all have that question. Uh, I look at it again on the wall, what happens after I die? And that seems like a morbid thought to those who don't have Christ. But when we have Christ, it, that, it's not something that's frightening to me. No. And it's not something that's frightening to those who have, uh, have stepped into the kingdom of light and out of that kingdom of darkness and have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So this is a time for you to step out of darkness, step out of fear, and step into a relationship with God. And I, there's nothing that is more rewarding or brings more pay to us. We like to get paid. Don't we like to get paid? There's nothing that brings more pay to us yes, than to see people recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. And so tonight, I believe we're about ready to have church. Yes, we're getting ready and it's exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Smith, that, and not only that unconditional lo love that you found through Jesus Christ for the world. Thank you for that wonderful smile. Oh, thanks, Mary. <laughs> well, God bless you, <laughs> Pastor Chuck. It's been a great, uh, a great time having you here with us again. Thank you. And I think it's time that we go into the service and just see what the answer to that question, what happens after I die. Hey, listen, some of you are going to be getting on the phone. You're going to be plugging in to the reason, and that's Jesus Christ. Come on, let's go into the service. Our God is indeed great and greatly to be praised. We've come here tonight to introduce many of you for the first time to the only rock that you can build your life upon. And that rock isn't a thing, it's a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. We're gonna celebrate him right now.
Hard to believe, but this is the 10th year for the Harvest Crusades here in Orange County, and it's been a blessing and a thrill to see what the Lord has done through these crusades, the many people who have come to Jesus Christ, and we rejoice in the goodness of God. And we're so glad that you're here tonight, and we're looking forward to the next two nights after tonight as we just expect God to be doing wonderful things in our midst, and it's just a joy to be a part of what God is doing. We're glad you're here, but we're also glad that the Lord is here. And we're going to ask Pastor Graydon Jessup of the Eastside Christian Church to come and ask God's blessing upon this crusade this year. Shall we stand for prayer? Let's pray together. Holy Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come into your presence in this great place to worship and honor you. I just praise your name and thank you for the wonderful time of worship, the wonderful time of music. And I pray that as we enter into speaking and teaching and decision-making, that, Father, that you would be in the very center of everything that is done in this place. I pray, Father, that this would become a holy place, that it would be a place where your presence would reign supreme. We have prayed for this crusade. We have prepared for this crusade. And now it's time to deliver. Father, I pray especially for Greg as he brings the word, as he speaks to us from his heart and from the scripture. May we have a fresh vision of Jesus Christ. And even though there's a large crowd, I pray that each of us individually would be able to hear specifically what he is saying. And may your Holy Spirit draw that word to our hearts and to our minds. And Father, I pray it would be almost like as if Greg were sitting across the table and chatting with us over a cup of coffee. May you take that implanted word, and Father, may you be able to do with it what only you can do. So we pray your blessing on everything that is sung and said and done in this place. We praise your name and we bless you in Jesus' name, amen.
It's wonderful for us to be a part of the Harvest Crusade. How are you guys doing in Anaheim tonight? I'm glad you're here. We're here tonight to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And Jesus Christ himself said that his gospel is peace. And Pastor Greg Laurie is going to be up here in a few minutes to talk about how you can know that peace. We're going to sing about it right now. We'd like for you to sing with us. So try this.
For the past 10 years of the Crusades, we've been blessed to have Crystal Lewis with us each year, and this year is no exception. We've all grown to love her and to appreciate her marvelous music. It's inspired us, and she's here tonight to sing again. Crystal Lewis. I grew up in the church, and my dad was a pastor, and I still was a brat. <laughs> I know, you don't believe that, do you? I, I um, still had to come to a place where I decided Jesus is what I need. I knew him, and I knew what he could do, because I saw him do it in the lives of people in my dad's church. But I had to come to a place myself of saying, oh, God, I need you. I surrender, and I want to be totally different. And I don't want to be mean, and I don't want to be a brat to my mom, and I don't want to be the way that I was, but I want to be like you. And that's what this song is about.
we've never done before. Stand by me
Tonight, my topic is a serious one, one that we're all going to have to come face to face with eventually, sooner than we may think. This evening, I want to speak to you 
on what happens after I die. But before I begin this message, I'd like to show you a little video. We shot this out in the streets in the last two days, and we asked people on the street the simple question, what do you think will happen after you die? <laughs> What happens when I die? I have two different philosophies about that. Maybe they come back um, as something else, depending on what they did in their previous life. Or maybe they go on to a different plane that we don't know about. Well, I believe everybody goes to the same place, whether you believe in God or not. Well, everyone's going to be judged. I think we all started from a little organism in the earth, and I hope to feed that organism when I go. I've seen better days. They bury me and I uh, get eaten by worms. I've seen better days. I don't know. I haven't died yet. They bury you. I haven't really gave it much thought. If you do bad things, you might go to purgatory. Come back as another good person. <laughs> I think you either go to heaven or hell. Well, I guess some of us go to hell, some of us go to heaven. Um, I don't believe in hell. I believe in heaven, I think. Go to God. He can judge. I know exactly where I'm going to go, and I know how I'm going to get there, and it's my choice. I, I don't believe in an afterlife. I just believe you're just up there. Your soul is just up there. This is the end. I think you're reincarnated to learn all the lessons that you need to learn, and you reach the highest level, and then you're in nirvana. This is the end. Now, our existence here is only one level and only one universe and there could be millions of them parallel to ours that we don't know about and then when we die we go from one to the other. You get pumped full of sherm and that's just like the best high you can get. I believe that our souls go somewhere but I don't really know where. I don't know what it is. I don't really have an opinion about it yet. Stay there, come back, or go somewhere else. Mm, well, I, I strongly believe I'll go into my next life. I don't really think anything happens, you know? Um, but then again, I can't say for sure. I mean, how are we to know? I mean, I didn't know where I came from before I was born, so how do I know where I'm going to go after I die? This is the end. Interesting responses. What happens when I die? I'm amazed at how people just make up stuff. And just sort of, yeah, whatever, I don't think you'll come back at all, or you'll just become worm food. How can there be so much uncertainty about something that is so significant? Listen, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of every one persons will die. You're going to die. But what's going to happen? We've all been shocked by the unexpected and tragic death of JFK Jr. in the last few days. We felt as though we knew him because we have followed his life since he was a little boy. Who can forget that scene that's frozen in our memories of that tiny little boy of three in short saluting his assassinated father's casket as it passed by. We watched him grow up to be a good-looking young man and we called his father's administration Camelot. Well, if President Kennedy was King Arthur, then JFK Jr. was certainly the crowned Prince. But it's shocking when the prince dies. It reminds me of the reaction to the unexpected death of Princess Diana. It just doesn't seem that someone as beautiful and as vibrant and as alive as her could just suddenly be gone. But listen, even princes and princesses die. Billionaires die. Rock stars die. Presidents die. Everybody is going to die. Death is the great equalizer. Death is no respecter of persons. We all have to come to grips with that. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers, and also presently the uh, interim chairman, or whatever he calls himself, made this statement recently in Forbes magazine, quote, life is short and we're all going to die soon. It's true, you know, end quote. Michael J. Fox, star of many films and television programs, found out not too long ago that he has Parkinson's disease. And he made this statement, realizing the potential shortness of his life, and I quote, I realize that I'm vulnerable, that no matter how many awards I'm given or how big my bank account is, I can be messed with like that. The end of the story is, Fox says, you all die. We're going to die. 
And it's true. We're going to have to face death. The Bible even says there is a time to be born and there is a time to die. USA Today recently conducted a poll among its readers and asked this question. If you could ask God a question and get a direct answer, what would you ask Him? The number one question was, what is my purpose here on earth? And I'll talk about that tomorrow night. The second question was, will I have life after death? And the third question was, how long will I live? Now I can't give you the answer to that final question, how long will you live? Because no one really knows. The Bible says that God appoints the time of our birth. And the Bible also teaches He has appointed the hour in which we die. The Bible says you have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live and we are not given a minute longer. The Bible tells us it is appointed unto a man once to die and then comes the judgment. Therefore, we need to heed the biblical admonition to prepare to meet our God. You see, JFK Jr., when he got into that plane and was making his way down to Martha's Vineyard, had no idea that that wedding he was going to attend was going to turn into his funeral. He had no idea that that was going to be his last night on the planet Earth. And none of us knows. You know, I had a reporter ask me the other day, how are you going to preach this year knowing that this is the last Harvest Crusade of the 20th century? I said, well, I'll preach at it the way I've preached at all of them. I treat each crusade as though it could be my last. I preach as a dying man to dying men. In other words, I preach as someone who recognizes the fact that I may not be here next year, and I know that some of you aren't going to be here next year because the Lord could come back, and those of us who have put our faith in Him could be in heaven, and that's the best alternative of all. And that could happen. But then, of course, death could come. With a crowd this size, we simply know that some of us are not going to be alive next year. I've received letters from people who have told me the stories of those that came to Christ and died months later or maybe a year later. That could be you. That could be me. That is why we need to prepare to meet our God. And I ask you tonight, are you prepared? Are you ready? What if this were your last night on earth? Are you involved in things you would be ashamed to be doing when you stand before God? If so, then make the necessary changes because God has graciously given you another day, another night. And in a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to meet God. Don't let it pass by. You may never see another one like it again. Because the Bible says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. As I said, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. It's hard for us to admit, but we're getting older. I'm 10 years older than when we started. And I still think I'm young, but there are those little reminders that age is creeping up on me. Sometimes I'll walk by a mirror and not realize it's my reflection and think, who's that old guy? Oh, it's me. Oh, no. I was driving my car the other day and looking at my hands and said, you know what? I've got old man hands. When did that happen? You know, you're getting old because kids start referring to you as Mr. You know, age is creeping up. Now, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't be 18 again for anything, but sometimes you don't like that affected age has on you. You don't see as well as you used to see. You know, type mysteriously starts getting smaller. It seems as though people speak in more hushed tones, but the fact is you're losing your ability to hear. You're losing your ability to see as well as you once did. I heard about a couple who were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. The husband was so moved by the occasion, he decided to publicly speak of his devotion to his wife, and he turned to his wife and he said, My dear, after 50 years, I have found you tried and true. Well, she was a little bit hard of hearing, and she said, what? He said, my dear, after 50 years, I have found you tried and true. And misunderstanding what she said, well, she said, after 50 years, I'm tired of you too. You see, when you're young, you like change. You like adventure. You like excitement. But you know what? When you get older, you start liking routine, sameness, knowing what to expect, right? You can see this, by the way, adults and kids go to Disneyland. 
I mean, when you get to Disneyland as a kid, and as soon as you get in, what do you want to do? You want to run to the most radical ride in the park and get on it, and then after you're done, get in line and go on it again. When you're an adult, you want to go eat. Where are the restaurants? When you're young, after you've ridden the most radical ride, you want to go play a video game or do something else exciting. When you're older, you want to go sleep to digest what you ate a little bit earlier. When you're young, you want to go to Tomorrowland. When you're older, you'd go to Yesterdayland if there was one. You'll say things like, oh, I remember when Walt was around. Yeah, those were the days. Time is marching on. We're getting older. But the big question is, what happens after we die? What happens after this body ceases to exist? I mean, in one sense, what one of those people said is true. We become worm food. I hate to be so blunt, but it's true. The body ceases to exist, but the real you, the soul, continues on. I heard the story about a man who lived in Chicago, and it was a very cold winter, and he wanted to go to a warmer climate, so he decided to vacation in Florida. His wife was on a business trip, and she was going to join him a day later. So after his arrival in sunny Florida, he decided to dash off a quick email to his wife, but he couldn't remember her email address, so he typed it from memory. But unfortunately, the email that he sent did not go to his wife, but it went to a grieving widow who had just lost her husband. He had died two days earlier. And so she checks her email, and she saw this message on the screen, and she thought it was from her deceased husband, and she let out a loud shriek. Her family members came rushing in. What is it? And they looked on the screen and saw this message. Dearest wife, just checked in. Everything is ready for your arrival tomorrow. P.S. It sure is hot down here. Now we laugh at that, but there really is an afterlife. There really is a heaven, and yes, there really is a hell. And the question is, where are you going to go when you die? I'm sorry to say, well, I don't know if I'm sorry to say it, but I need to say it, that you're not going to come back as a higher life form or a lower life form. You're not going to come back in any life form. You're not going to go to a place called purgatory. You're going to leave this life, and you're going to stand ultimately before God Himself. There's no reincarnation. So you can just set that idea aside altogether. As I've already quoted, the scripture says, it's appointed unto a man once to die, and then comes the judgment. Where are you going to spend eternity? Now I know the moment I mentioned the word hell, some of you probably got mad at me. You know, you were all right for a moment, but when you said the H word, you lost me, buddy. But you know what? I wouldn't be a faithful preacher of the gospel if I didn't tell you that hell is real. And let me also add the fact that the last place God wants you to end up in is this horrible place called hell. He didn't create it for people. Jesus said hell was created for the devil and his angels, and Christ has done everything possible to keep you out of that place. Listen, God wants you to join him in heaven. He wants you to spend all eternity with him in a new body. And if you get to heaven, and I hope most of you will, and you're looking for me and Chuck Smith, Remember, we're going to have glorified bodies. You look for the two guys with big afros. That'll be me and Chuck in heaven and our new bodies. Or some kind of a hair thing going on. I don't know what. Some people have a bad hair day. I'd like to have an any hair day, you know. But you decide where you're going to go. You decide where you're going to spend eternity. Listen, no one is going to end up in heaven in that final day by accident, and no one is going to end up in hell in that final day by accident. They'll be there by a deliberate choice that they made in this life. Let's say that I wanted to go to New York City. So I go down to LAX, or I go down to Orange County Airport, John Wayne Airport. I can't just walk on a plane of my choice and grab a nice seat and expect to go where I want to go. First of all, I have to buy a ticket. And I have to make sure that there's room on the flight uh, that is going to the place that I want to go to. And in the same way, I have two choices beyond this life, heaven or hell. I decide where I'm going to go. You say, well, what about the ticket? Well, you need to get one. Well, how much will it cost? Well, you couldn't afford it. But I've got good news for you. Someone purchased your ticket. 
That someone is Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you 2,000 years ago and shed His blood for your ticket so you can go to heaven. Now let's just say that I said, well, I don't want a ticket and I just boarded a flight. And as they were getting ready to taxi down the runway, the stewardess comes up to me and says, excuse me, sir, I, I don't remember seeing your ticket stuff. Well, I don't have one. Well, sir, you can't fly in this plane without a ticket. But ma'am, I'm a good person. Well, sir, that's nice, but you can't fly. Well, ma'am, I'm not as bad as some people are. Sir, I don't know if you've lost your mind or what, but you need a ticket. And you see, there are people that say, well, I, I don't deserve to go to hell. I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as others. The question is, do you have the ticket? Have you been forgiven of your sin? Do you know right now with complete assurance that if you died, you would go to heaven? If not, you need to know this. What is more important than that? Where will you spend eternity? Let's read the Bible for a moment. Revelation chapter 20. This is a behind-the-scenes look. It was going to happen beyond the grave. And let me just say, I guarantee that what I am reading is absolutely true. And you are going to face this if you don't know Christ. Don't let this happen. Listen to what the Bible says. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the thing which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Notice that again and again in those verses the phrase, the dead is used. The dead. We don't like that word. Dead. Die. It's uncomfortable. It's the D word, you know. When someone dies, we don't like to say they died. We say, well, they passed away. Or to be more clinical, they expire. Or they're no longer with us. They've gone to a better place. Insurance salesmen don't like to admit it in their sales pitch. You know, if something should happen to you, if, what, like I'm not going to die maybe? But no one wants to say that word. Or we'll show our discomfort with the topic of death by saying, well, you know, they, they kick the bucket. They reach room temperature. They bit the dust. They cashed in their chips. And these very terms show that we are very uncomfortable with the topic of death. It baffles us. It frightens us. Why? Because we're afraid to die. The Bible speaks of those who are held in slavery by fear of death. It's the fear of the unknown. The fear of what is out there that I can't see. In the dome of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., these words are written, quote, one God, one law, one element, and one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. And that one event is the judgment. And that's what we're reading about right here. John, who writes these words that were given to him by Jesus, says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. As I already said, death is no respecter of persons. You may have been a superstar on earth, someone powerful. Someone famous, someone not known at all. But death is that great equalizer. And then there's the judgment. And know that the Bible speaks often of a future judgment. Now you may say, I don't believe in a judgment. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe. Well, you can say whatever you want, but the reality is judgment is there. And hell is there. And you're going to have to face it. The Bible says in the book of Acts that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. Second Peter 2 says the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of their sinful nature. Jesus said, I say to you that every idle word that a man will speak, he'll give an account of on the day of judgment. Now on one hand, we like the idea of a future judgment because that means that all the bad guys that have ripped us off are going to get theirs, right? Yeah, you got me now, but your day's coming, man. Judgment day. 
But we don't like to think about ourselves on that judgment day. But know this, God keeps very accurate records and the Bible says the wrongdoer will be paid back for every wrong he has done. Every wrong in the universe will ultimately be paid for. Listen now. Every wrong in the universe will ultimately be paid for. Either it will be paid for by Jesus Christ who died on the cross and if that offender repents of their sin and puts their faith in Christ, they'll be forgiven or it will be paid for by the person who committed the sins. You say, no, I'll do a bunch of good deeds and the good deeds will sort of counteract the bad deeds. As though God somehow grades on the curve. Let's just say for a the sake of a point, that was true, that if you did enough good deeds it would get you into heaven. Do you honestly think that you've done more good deeds in your life than bad ones? Do you honestly think you've done more good in your life than bad? I mean, come on, let's be honest now. But the fact is, that's not what you're going to be judged by. It's not about how many good deeds you've done. And the good news is, even if you've done many horrible things, there's still a chance for you. It's not based on how good you are. It's based on the fact of the ticket. Do you have the ticket? Have you put your faith in Christ? In that final day the question to you will be, what did you do with Jesus Christ? Because the Bible says there is no other name given under heaven whereby a man can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Christ is the way to be forgiven. Christ is the way to heaven. And He's here for you tonight. It is interesting that the Bible says that books are opened, plural, more than one. And then it says a book is open, which is the book of life. Now what are these books? We don't know for certain, but we can offer an educated guess based on what the Bible says. Maybe one of those books would be a book of God's law, the commandments of God. Because there are people out there that say, well, I don't need Jesus Christ. I live by the Ten Commandments. Oh, is that so? Oh, yes, it's so. You live by the Ten Commandments. Have you ever had another God before Him? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever coveted something that did not belong to you? Have you ever lied? Have you ever murdered anyone? If you've broken one of these commandments, the Bible says you're guilty of all of them. See, well, I've lived by the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one? Well, okay, maybe one. You offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. You see, the law was given to open your eyes and to shut your mouth. The Bible says that God gave it that every mouth may be shut because for all of those that would claim to be righteous, I'm a good person. I live a perfect life. No. Here's the commandments of God. You fall short. So I'm certain that one of these books would be a book of the law. Another would be a record of everything we've said or done. Everything you've done. Everything you've said has been recorded. The Bible says God will judge us for everything we do, including every hidden thing, good or bad. The Bible says every idle word that a man speaks, he'll give an account of in the day of judgment. It's all recorded. Oh, but we did it under the cover of night. We closed the door. Oh yeah, as if God doesn't see. All things are naked and open before the one with whom we have to do, the Bible says. God's aware of everything that you've ever done. He's aware of every thought that you've ever thought. He sees all. You can't hide from Him. Why would you even try? Perhaps another book would be to show that you have failed to live up to even your own standards. Because there are people that say, well, I don't believe in Christianity. I, I sort of have my own religion. It's the religion of me. And uh, I sort of make it up as I go, you know, and these are the standards that I live by. I suggest to you, you don't even live up to your own standards. I suggest to you that you violate your own sense of right and wrong. My youngest son, Jonathan, who's 50, asked me the other day, no he's not 50, he's 13. I'm not that old. He asked me the question, Dad, what would happen to a person if they were on a desert island and they never heard about Jesus Christ? I thought that was a new twist on it. It's usually someone in the jungle. This was a desert island. If they'd never heard about Jesus, what would God do with them? It's a good question. It's a question that a lot of people ask. I believe that God will hold you accountable for what you know. By the light you've received, so to speak. 
But the Bible teaches that deep down inside, God's law is written on our hearts. For our own conscience either accuses us, uh, accuses us or tells us what we are doing is right. We know what is right. We know what is wrong. We have violated our conscience. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. There is the testimony of God, if you will, in creation all around you. You violated that. You violated your own conscience. But listen, don't worry about the person stranded on the desert island. God will deal justly and lovingly and graciously with them. But think about you because you're not on a desert island. You're in the Edison field and you're hearing the gospel and you'll be held accountable for what you've heard tonight. You might ask, well, what do you mean by that? What I mean is you're going to be held accountable for what you've heard. Here's what you've heard. In case you haven't heard it, let me say it again. You've heard or you're hearing that Jesus Christ, who is more than a good man, he was the God man, came to this earth and died on the cross for our sins because there was nothing I could do to reach a perfect God, nothing I could do to scale that huge chasm that separated me from Him. He loved me so much He laid His life down and died and took the penalty for my sins. And with one hand He took hold of a holy God and with another hand He took hold of sinful humanity and spikes were driven through those hands and He bled and died there for me. And then He rose again from the dead and He's alive and here and He is knocking at the door of your heart and He is saying, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. You feel that knock right now? Let Christ come in tonight. You'll be glad you did. This verse 15 of this uh, text I just read says, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You might ask, what do you mean by the second death? Let me simplify it. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, let me explain it. If you're born once, you'll die twice. Born once, you're born physically, you're going to die physically, and then you're going to face the second death, which speaks of the judgment. But if you're born twice, physically, and then by putting your faith in Christ, you're born again, you'll die once. Yeah, you'll leave this earth, but then you'll stand before God and be admitted into heaven because you've got the ticket, because you've trusted Christ. It's your choice. It's entirely up to you. Let's say you were cruising down the 405 freeway and you came to one of those big overpasses there and they blocked it off because they were doing some construction and maybe there had been a collapse and there was great danger. So as you're driving up, you're on your way to work, you see a bunch of signs saying, no admittance, stop, bridge out, overpass out. Oh, what do these guys know? I drive it every day. So you speed on. Boom! You break through the barricades. You're still moving on. You see some police officers. They have their cars parked in your path. Their lights are flashing. The officers are telling you to stop. Bam! You break through the police cars. You're still speeding on. You see construction guys waving. Stop! Stop! You keep speeding on. And you plunge over the side and you fall to your own death. Now whose fault would that be? The construction crew? The police officers? No, it was your own fault. You ignored the warnings. In the same way, anyone who ends up in hell in that final day has no one to blame but themselves because God has placed the warning signs. He's holding up one for you tonight. Don't go that way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go that way, Jesus said, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there are that find it. Will you be one of those few? It doesn't just go with the crowd and do what everybody else does and says what everybody else says. But instead, you know, I'm going to do what I know is right. I'm going to follow Christ. You'll be glad you did. Because death is coming. And it might be coming sooner than you think. John F. Kennedy Jr., though he was the son of a popular president, was not immune from the clutches of death. Carolyn Bessette Kennedy and her sister, who were with him on that flight, that was to be their last, did not know that was their final night, but it was. What if this were your final night? 
where would you spend eternity? Well, I don't know, but I hope the good Lord up there is in a good mood when I... Now, come on, let, stop that. You can know. Well, you know one can know. No, I'm telling you, you can know that you'll go to heaven. I know it. Well, that's pretty arrogant of you to say. It's not arrogant. It's based on God's word to me. The Bible says that if I put my faith in Christ, I am forgiven. The Bible says these things we write to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I know it because Christ has promised it to me and I've accepted His promise. I've got the ticket. Do you know? The Bible says His Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. I know it. I have that inner assurance. Do you have it? Well, I don't know. Oh, come on. That can change. Well, what do I have to do? You need to come to Christ. Well, how do I do that? I'm going to tell you how right now. He's here in this stadium. Well, I don't see him. Where is he? Is he on the platform? He's here. He's knocking at the door of your heart. He wants to come in, but you've got to let him in. You've got to say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. And I turn from there now, and I put my faith in you. Well, if I was raised in the church, does that help? Well, it's good. But it's not enough to just be raised in the church. There has to be a moment when you put your faith in Christ. Well, I have a bunch of Bibles at home. Does that help? Listen, having a Bible at home doesn't make you a Christian any more than having Tang in your cupboard makes you an astronaut. There has to come a moment in every person's life when they put their faith in Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Have you done that? If not, would you like to? Do you want that inner assurance? Do you want to know that you know that you're going to heaven? I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. In a moment, we're going to pray. And then I'm going to invite you to come to Christ. I'm going to invite you to receive the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed. I'm going to invite you to walk out of the Edison field knowing that you know that you'll go to heaven. It can happen for you tonight. Yes, it can. I'm going to invite you to have that emptiness that's inside of you filled with Christ, that hole in your heart you've tried to fill with drugs or with alcohol or with partying or with sex or with possessions or accomplishments or relationships. God holds the missing piece you've been searching for. I'm going to invite you to come to Christ. And I'm going to invite some of you prodigal sons and daughters out there tonight that knew the Lord at one time but have gone astray to come back home tonight. To the Lord. So you be thinking about what you're going to do. Let's all pray. Father, we thank you tonight that your word is true. We thank you that you love us so much. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Now we pray for those here that do not yet know you, those here who have not put their faith in you, those who are not yet ready to die. Lord, help them to see their need for you. Help them to come to you. And speak to those, Lord, who've gone astray that need to come back home again tonight. Work now in our midst and bring many into your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen. Here's what's needed right now. Here's what you need to do. Do you want to be forgiven of your sin in a moment? I'm going to ask you to do what thousands have done over these past 10 years in this very stadium. I'm going to ask you in a moment, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want the forgiveness of sin, to get up out of your seat and to come down to this field behind the stage. And then when you all get down here, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment to Christ. You might ask, well, what do I need to get up and go down to a field? Well, it's a way to publicly state that you mean business. Jesus said, if you will acknowledge me before people, I will acknowledge you before the Father and the angels in heaven. But he said, if you deny me before people, I will deny you before the Father and the angels. I'm going to ask you to make a public stand for Christ. And this is a way to do that. No matter what you've done, how many sins you've committed, God will pardon you. God will accept you. But you must come. You say, well, Greg, I'm getting on in years. You know, I'm one of those older folks you described. And, well, Greg, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I've got good news for you. You're not a dog and these aren't tricks. You're a person made in God's image and He can change you tonight if you'll come to Him. 
You might say, but Greg, I've done so many horrible things. I'm so ashamed of well, whatever you've done. Christ died for those sins, but you've got to ask for his forgiveness. You might say, well, I'm a good person, and I think I've lived a good life. That's fine, but you're not good enough. You still fall short. You've still sinned, and you still need Christ. I'm going to ask you now to get up out of your seat. Come on down to this floor, down to this field, and make your stand for Jesus. Young people, older people, men, women, boys and girls, come and find the forgiveness of sins. Come and receive eternal life. Come receive that answer to the questions you've been asking, that fulfillment deep inside of your heart. You that have gone astray, come back to the Lord tonight. The rest of you, please, just pray. Pray for these that are making this decision. Come with your sins. Come with your problems. Come with your shortcomings. Come just as you are, as Crystal sings for you. Get up and come to Christ now. Just as you are, hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are, come and see, come receive, come and You might say, well, I'll come back tomorrow night and think about what you've said, or the night after that, or maybe next year. Well, you're certainly welcome to come back. But what guarantee do you have that there will be a tomorrow night for you? You might say, oh, trying to use scare tactics on us now? No. You see, there is a day when all of us are going to die. The Bible says, don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what a day will bring. No one has a guarantee they'll be here. That is why the Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Listen, tonight is your night. Don't let this opportunity slip by. Now, maybe there's a big old long line right now, but hey, listen, we're in Southern California. We're used to lines. This is a line worth waiting in. Just get in that line and be patient. And we'll wait for all of you. There might be some of you way up there in the very tippy top. You say, well, that's a long walk. Yes, it is. It's a good little jaunt. But I believe it will be the best one you've ever made as you accept Christ into your life. We'll wait till you all get here, but you need to get up and come now. Come just as you are. We're waiting for you. More importantly, God's waiting for you. Get up and come.
heard the gospel preached very clearly tonight again by Greg Laurie and the people are literally pouring out on the, the field by the thousands and uh, you can be wherever you are you can be giving your heart to God tonight and he preached on a, a subject that we're, we'll all deal with what happens to me after after I die we don't think we're gonna die but but don't, don't like to think about it period right you know what he said tonight he said that statistics have proven that one out of every one yes. dies. Everybody, uh, and, and we never know when. We don't want to think about it. We don't, we don't like to deal with it. It's not a pleasant thing, especially if you don't know where you're going or what's going to happen to you when you die. But these people are settling it tonight. Yes. Look at the people. Look at them coming on the fields. And I've, I've, I've watched them, Dean. I've seen the tears running down their cheeks, just totally moved. Uh, Pastor Greg Laurie has preached it so simply, yeah. yet so pointed. You know, the, the, this is, uh, the, I believe these are the, the sermons that really touch people's hearts, and it, and it opens our eyes to a reality that we're all going to face judgment, as the Bible says, and Greg used the scripture, it's appointed. It's appointed. We have an appointment. But this is not something really that is a scare tactic or something that should, should uh, bring fear into you, but it should bring you to a place where you can let your faith touch God and you can ask Him to come into your heart because this is not something that we as believers have a fear of. We can settle it. You can settle it tonight by, by as we're under the stars here in the, in the beautiful stadium here in Anaheim, and wherever you are, you can settle it and just say in a simple way and in your own words, however you want to speak it, just say, Jesus, I, I really want to know after I leave and after I, I vacate this body where, where I'm going to be, what's going, going to happen. Lord, I want to live with you. I want you to forgive me of all of my sin, all of the things that I've been and all of the ungodly things that I've done in my, my life. Father, I ask you to come into my heart and to forgive me now you know he's a faithful father the bible says he's a faithful father that keeps covenant and mercy with all those who trust him and will believe him there's not anything that touches his heart more than for you to say father i trust you father i believe you and i'm ready to receive you now if you've said that prayer if you've called on him there's a number that's on your screen 714-731-1000 we'll put you in touch with somebody who can even solidify that further in your heart in your life well we come to jesus just like all these people these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are doing tonight on the Anaheim Angels playing field. Yes. When we come to Jesus, it really puts us all on the same level. See, we might think this person's better than me or I'm, I'm, I'm better, I live better than this person over here. But when we come to Jesus, we come just as we are, yes. just as Crystal Lewis has been singing tonight, we come just like we are. Yes. and puts us all on the same level. And on that very same level, Jesus opens up his arms and he accepts us yes. with love that we can't even comprehend up here in our minds, but yet mm -hmm. he loves you that much. Mm -hmm. He loves you that much. So this is your very special night you under know, the stars. You know what I see as we were even closing here for the for the Harvest Crusade for this first night, I see a big sign that says Korean section. I see signs around that, that uh, has the Spanish section. I see the signs around, right there. Uh, you know, Japanese. All of us, we're, we're all the same. Well, you know, our culture doesn't make us different. We all have to come to that place of recognizing Jesus Christ as Lord. A Savior, the Savior, the Savior. Jesus Christ. Have you called on Him? Right now, he, he's, he's waiting. It's been a great night of music and inspiration. We have some more. Uh, coming uh, the next couple of nights. So, so please, uh, if, if you've never, not settled this question or you have friends or family, someone that, that you, uh, you know needs to come into the kingdom of God, I believe this, these sermons that Greg Laurie is preaching will certainly bring them to a place of realization they need God. This, this field right here that we are standing on literally is the playing field of the Anaheim Angels baseball team. But tonight, this is no game. This is for eternity, forever and ever and ever. What will happen to you after you die? I'm so glad that you very possibly have been one of the thousands upon thousands 
during this Harvest Crusade who have accepted Jesus as Savior. So uh, stay with us for tomorrow evening and the next few nights for Harvest Crusade 1999, the last Harvest Crusade of this century. And listen, before this century is over, before this night is over, before this program is over, you can settle things with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been a great evening, and we've had a lot of fun, and especially when people have come into the kingdom of God. So, Don't God, forget to call and let us know. Yes, though. God bless you, and we'll see you right here again tomorrow night for more of Harvest Crusade 1999. And let, every, and let everything that hath breath Have praise the Lord. Mercy now on me. Forgive me, oh Lord, forgive me. And I will be. I want to welcome each one of you that have come down to this field to make this stand for Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. Can you all hear me down here? All right. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask that as I pray this prayer, you would pray it out loud after me. And this is where you are asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart to be your Savior and Lord. It's a prayer only you can pray. Someone else cannot pray it for you. So mean it from your heart and pray it out loud with me now. And this is where you are asking for God's forgiveness, okay? Pray this with me right now. Pray this out loud. God, I'm sorry for my sin. And I turn from it tonight. I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross and to shed his blood for every sin I've ever committed. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my friend. Fill me with your Spirit and help me to follow you from this night forward as your disciple. Thank you for accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the family of God. And God bless each one of you. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today. Praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write TBN, P.O. Box 768, Station B, Ottawa, Ontario, K1P, 5P8. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, Call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now until next time, remember, 
to praise the Lord. This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.